going to try to see if I can bring some resolution to our discussion about Daniel. We are doing our final part. My bad, I got to you from last week, but we're now actually in part three. We looked at Daniel's dreams um, in chapter seven of the book of Daniel. We know in the first six chapters, it was more of a personal account of what went on with Daniel and his interpretation of others' dreams, uh, particularly Nebuchadnezzar and the, and the vision that his Nebuchadnezzar's son had with the handwriting. And um, you know him being in the lion's den, and then with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all those personal accounts. But now he's gone, uh, shifted, if you will. God has shifted the narrative to focus more on the future. Uh, he gave Daniel uh, revelations about things which were to come. Um, and he started out talking about how the sea was stirred, and then four different beasts appeared one after the other. And we saw how in Daniel 7, 3 through 7, he described those four beasts. One was, was a lion that had eagle's wings. In chapter number four, one was a bear, or appeared like a bear, said, verse five. And then there was the leopard. And then the one with 10 horns. I want to pause a little bit and talk about this because one of the things about prophecies is we don't know the whole story. So sometimes you uh, may hear me say no, like someone asked, well, is that Rome? When they were talking about, uh, we were talking about Revelation. I said no in the sense that we know that the previous Roman Empire fell. And we don't know for sure. Many think, and we'll see when we get to that, but many think the future uh, Antichrist will rise out of Rome. Some you know, attributed, as I said before, to the Vatican and the Pope and all those sorts of things. But I said no initially because we don't know. The scripture in First Corinthians 13 says we know in part. Now there's a lot of speculation as to the Antichrist, the end times evolving out of Rome. So I won't say this no is emphatic, like I absolutely know, but I'm always hesitant to automatically assume that I know anything. We know what many scholars think, but at the end of the day, we know in part. And there are things that God has shown this generation that the previous generation didn't know and so forth. I also want to pause because one of the things that I heard several different people talk about was fear as they saw the imagery that was being described in, in Daniel's uh, visions as well as um, the book of revelations they had fear and i want to dispel that fear uh, we know the word of god said god did not give us a spirit of fear right i see beatrice wise raise hand okay i'll get with you and answer your question give me one minute um god did not give us a spirit of fear but a power love and a sound mind and that's important because Whatever we're reading in the scripture, we know is inspired by God. The word of God, all of the truth of God's word is inspired. He breathed it through human beings over the course of 1500 years. So that lets us know that we have nothing to fear. It's funny because yesterday I was meditating as I was preparing myself for this class. And why did Pastor Jenkins get up and preach what I was thinking about, I said, God, you've done it again. <laughs> because I was meditating on Jeremiah 29, 11. Many of these imageries that we see are futuristic. Uh, some of them we can look back because they've already occurred, but they were futuristic when Daniel prophesied. But we don't have to be afraid. Why? Because what does Jeremiah 29, 11 tell us? He says, I know the plans I have for you, or depending on what version, the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. They're to give you a hope and a future. Watch this, not to harm you. So when we're reading about these images and seeing this imagery, remember it is symbolic. Like we see lion with eagle's wings. We know it wasn't a lion that God was showing to Daniel. It was symbolic of a a, a, a great nation that will rise up in the in the kind of tone or attitude of a lion, which is 
you know, stately, which is powerful, which is considered to be kingly. So I'm saying all that to say two things. One is, remember when you're reading these, they represent symbolically imagery that God wants to draw in our mind, but they're not actual uh, word for word translations of what somebody or something would look like. Because again, we'll look and see how these four beasts, as we review from last week, what they represent. My most important thing I want you to take away is you don't have to be afraid because as we said last week, we win in the end. More than that, God's promise to you in Jeremiah 29, 11 is that he is not trying to harm you. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you hope and a future. So when we see these things, we should be looking for opportunities to find hope, not to be afraid. We should be looking to see how God is trying to encourage us not to bring fear into our hearts. So I want to bind that spirit of fear right now in the name of Jesus and to call into captivity every thought that they exalt itself against the knowledge of God in our lives because it's God's will that his people would prosper, that his people would have hope, and that they would be blessed because that's what he told us in his word. So consequently, even when you don't understand a thing, you don't have to fear it. You don't have to be afraid of it. You can be like Daniel, who after he had these visions, he spoke to the angel and he asked him, what do they mean? So in other words, if you have visions in your head, ask the Holy Ghost, what do they mean? What are you trying to speak to me? But you don't have to be afraid because in the backdrop of your life should always be the fact. God wants to prosper me. God wants to give me a hope. God wants to give me a future and God does not want to harm me. I don't know if that helps you, but for me, that was life changing. When I really got a hold of Jeremiah 29 and I realized when things are going on in my life, God's not trying to hurt me. I don't know if that helps you, but for me, it was life changing, as I said, because for a long time, I thought God was against me. I thought God was angry with me. I thought God was trying to hurt me, all kind of crazy stuff. I said, God, you must not love me. You let this happen and that happen. But God made me aware, I love you with an everlasting arm of love. For me, again, one of the life-changing verses, as high as the heavens above. Take some time when you go outside the next time and look up. How high do the heavens go? That's how much love God has for you. So if somebody loves you like that, you know they're not trying to hurt you. They're trying to bless you. He is a father. How many people know our fathers want us to have the best? He, they want to love us. Now, our earthly fathers, of course, are imperfect, but even in their imperfect estate, they try to give us their best, generally speaking. And therefore, if they, as, as the father in the Bible says, if they being evil know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more does God want to bless us and give us good gifts? So I need you to drive that notion of fear out of your mind. Get into your word, meditate on it, and remind yourself, gird, uh, chew on Jeremiah 29, 11, until it becomes first nature in you. I have no reason to fear. Why should I be afraid? If God be for me, who can be against me? I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. I have all that I need. God's will is that I will prosper and be in health, even as my soul does prosper. So I want to challenge that mindset that says, oh, when I see this stuff, I get scared. Scared of what? If God is on my side, if God be for us, who can be against us, right? So I want you to meditate on Jeremiah 29, 11. Meditate on Psalm 27. Meditate on Romans 8, 28 to the end. All these truths are there to let us know that no matter what we win, when it's all said and done, when the dust is settled, we win. Uh, if you saw my word of the day, you saw me trying to encourage you with this same concept. By our faith, we have the victory. And because of that, we don't have to be afraid. I may not know the future, but I know who holds the future. I may not understand my way, but I know who is the way. And so when you have that blessed assurance in your soul, you don't have to be afraid. 
So there are times, yes, there's uncertainties. It makes for a little bit more of a, a what's the word I want? A shakiness, for lack of a better word, can come upon us in the sense that we're not sure what the next step is. That's why God said what? Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. If you keep your eyes on him, he will guide you. I always liken it to a parent with a child. You know, if you took your child anywhere, a grandchild, niece, nephew, whatever, they're little, what they're going to do? They're going to hold your hand because they don't know where they're going. So they're holding on to you so they won't be afraid. Guess what? Hold to his hand, God's unchanging hand. Why? Because he will never lead you astray and he will protect you and guide you. So when a kid is with you, as long as they got your hand, they're good. They will follow you wherever you go. How many of us have that same trust in the Lord? I don't care where you're taking me, God, as long as you don't leave me by myself, I will be all right. So I need to challenge you. Don't allow fear to guard your heart. Let God's peace guard your heart. And if you're anxious about something, pray about it. But don't walk in fear. That's the enemy. Fear, there's no fear in God. Perfect love casts out fear. When you're resting in God, you know, you don't know all the way, but you know who got you. You have nothing to be afraid of. You know, I, I shared this testimony many times. When I was first married, I had several miscarriages. It was very disheartening. And when I got pregnant with my son, I remember feeling a little anxious and concerned. And my girlfriend said something that was so profound. It, it was simple yet profound because I would get these pains in my stomach. And, you know, of course, when you've had a miscarriage, you get a pain, you, you know, your, your tendency is to think, oh no, something bad is going on. And I remember her saying, baby, you're going to have to walk this out. And I said, you know what? You are so right. I'm not going to struggle every time I get a little pain. I'm not going to sweat it. I mean, part of being pregnant is you get pain. Kids get the kicking and body stretching every which kind of way. You're going to get some pain, baby. So instead of me fretting over those things, I just began to rest in it. And I said, hey, God, you got me. And that's what we have to do in life. Just rest in him. I may not know the way. I may not know every little bump and bruise, every little pain. But I know he's got me. And I know his plan is to be a blessing to me. Amen. So we usually take our questions at the end, but I did see b -Watt's hand. I'm going to take your question real quick, and then I'm going to move forward. What's your question, B? She didn't have a question. She was trying to fix her computer, she said. Oh, my bad. Okay, cool. All right, well, let's keep it moving. So these were the four beasts, and we saw um, in the first instance, chapter 7, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till his wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given it. And we know because of the story that we saw earlier about how when Nebuchadnezzar was so arrogant and so prideful that he, he was the great power at that time. His nation had conquered everyone. But he got up instead of giving glory to God, what did he say? Look at what I did. Look at me. Look at my. And so God prophesied in advance. How many know God does nothing without first revealing it to his prophets, the, his service the prophets? So he told Daniel in advance what was going to happen because Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And Nebuchadnezzar, uh, I mean, Daniel interpreted that dream. And he told him, you're going to eat grass just like an animal. Until you look up and give glory to God. And that's exactly what happened. So here we had a lion, an animal. Think of it. A lion walks on paws. It has eagle's wings. They pluck the wings off and then it stood up like a man. Well, he was given a man's heart. He began to give God the glory. This, of course, represented Nebuchadnezzar. And then there was a second beast, like a bear. It was raised up on one side, had three ribs in his mouth. This might have been a southern bear, right? But anyway, <laughs> he had three ribs in his mouth uh, between his teeth. And thus they said, arise, bow, much flesh. And we know that represented the medieval, metal Persian. I know I'm abusing that word. And then we had 
another one that looked like a lion with four wings or heads. Think of it, four wings, four heads, looking everywhere, is able to pounce at any point. It's strong. And that represented Greece. And then we saw the fourth beast. So when we look at Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and I'm trying to move forward kind of quickly because I know we kind of covered all this, but I'm just doing a quick review. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that looked like a man. It had a head of gold, it had chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs and feet of iron. And what we learned is this represented the same kingdoms that the dream that Daniel had uh, with the lion and the leopard and the bear and the ten horn. Interestingly, as uh, theologians view this, what they said was, if you look at it, Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel were seeing the same thing from two different angles. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, we think of him really being more carnal. You know, he wasn't a man of God. He saw it from a man's point of view, a human's point of view, you know, a man and head and gold and chest and legs and all of that. Whereas Daniel was seeing how man is viewed by God's point of view, you know, beastly, carnal and rough and so forth. Men often look at themselves in a more puffed up way, whereas God looks at us at our heart. So we then talked about uh, the four beasts, they represent four kingdoms. And then we saw how in the end, praise be to God, we win. And we have dominion forever. But let's go back. And out of the, the, that fourth beast, as I mentioned, we saw it rather had 10 horns. And out of that 10 horns, Daniel said he saw that there was another horn, a little one coming up among them before whom three of the first horns, so we got 10 horns and horns generally represent power. Uh, and so three horns, meaning three of the nations somehow were consumed by this one little horn. And then it had eyes all over it like a man and spoke pompous words. And we saw those words again, similar words when we looked at Revelation. So this is where uh, we see, and I'm not going to go back over, read it again, but this is where we saw the ancient days, which we know represents God. And there's some debate whether the ancient days in this instance is talking about Jesus versus God the Father. Many conclude it's God the Father, um, but some believe it's Jesus. Either way, they are one in the Godhead. And he sat on the throne and it was surrounded by fire and so forth. And the one with the pompous words, with the horn was speaking. And he watched and saw that it was slain. And then it says, and this is verse 13, uh, still in Daniel 7, I was watching in the night visions and behold one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days. So this is one of the reasons many believe the ancient of days represents the father because the son of man, if you look throughout scripture, Jesus is often referred to as son of man and son of God. So he comes in the clouds and we know from Thessalonians, first Thessalonians, that there is a day coming where he will return with the trumpet sound. Uh, but anyway, um, he returns and he is victorious. Then to him was given dominion and glory in a kingdom that all people's nation and language should serve him. And his dominion is forever. Praise be to God. Okay. Then we looked at this prophetic timeline and we saw the lion that uh, Daniel saw and how it represented, as I said, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian empire. Then that was replaced by the Medo-Persian empire which represented, was represented by the bear. And then the leopard was represented, represented by Greek, the Greek empire. Alexander the Great was their leader for those history buffs out there, which I was not, am not, I'll confess. 
and then the Roman Empire. So, which was represented by the beast with the 10 heads. Now, here's the piece where we crossed over the revelation because that little horn pops up. And so the question then becomes, um, was, is that last empire a Roman empire? And somebody asked that and I said, no, in a sense that this one was already, the, the first Roman empire is collapsed. Now there's a question as to whether that Roman empire will be revived. And that of course is debatable. Many scholars believe it will be a resurgence of the Roman empire from which the Antichrist rises, that little horn that pops up and destroys four nations, so to speak, and becomes a strong, some debate nation or leader in and of itself. Either way, it represents the Antichrist. Well, what is the Antichrist? Well, anytime you see anti, you know it's against. So the spirit of anything against Christ. So um, when we look, at Revelation 13, which we'll look at in a little bit, this is this description that parallels uh, most closely the things that Daniel says about that little horn. That's where the crossover or the connection between these books is. And, and the question, of course, again, is who is that uh, little horn representing? Some, again, as I said, think that's the resurgence or revival of the Roman Empire. Some don't. I think the majority view is that it will be a resurgence of the Roman Empire, but there are some that disagree. The bigger issue for me is kind of like, <laughs> I don't know if you all have any games. My girlfriend, Reverend Annie, loves to play Phase 10. Her and B. Watts would sit up playing to all kinds of nights. But anybody that sit at the table with Reverend Annie, she is a loving woman, but when it comes to phase 10, she is vicious. She don't play. That's her game. I guess I say all that to say anybody who sits in the place of the Antichrist, whether it's Rome or otherwise, it doesn't matter. They going down because in the end, we know our God wins. So for me, it's not something that I um, have a desire to spend a whole lot of time uh, digging into, though I find it interesting. But it's not something for me that is as captivating as knowing the big picture, which is that Christ reigns triumphant and we as his people reign triumphant in the end of it all. That's the most important thing to me. Now we know this is a whole study that people, many prophetic and others, other people spend a lot of years trying to grasp. It's important. And certainly if you want to delve into this, I would encourage you to take our classes related to the book of Revelation and, and end time prophecies. Um, those would be good classes to get more understanding and deeper understanding. My goal was really just to give a broad overview, which is always a challenge because of the intricacy of the, the topic. It's hard to really dibble and dabble in it without getting too caught up in it. But nevertheless, so we looked at the four kingdoms, the lion that Daniel saw represented the head of gold that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar saw, and that was Babylon. The bear that Daniel saw represented the chest and arms of silver that King Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. That re represented the media, Medo, Medo Persian empire. Then the leopard that Daniel saw represented the belly and thighs of bronze, which we said was Greece. It's interesting, again, when this happened in his dream, none of this stuff had come to pass. So some would say, well, maybe the Medo-Persian takeover was um, kind of obvious at what was happening in the world at that time. But to go into the level of detail that he had and then move to Greece and the Rome, it took a divine revelation. That is to say, God spoke prophetic words into Daniel that no human being had ever had spoken up to that point. So again, I encourage us to keep our hearts in tune with the Lord's 
be very prayerful and stay sensitive. And God will give you revelation as well. I don't know about you, but as I meditate on words and on the word of God and, and saturate my heart with the word, he will speak and give me clarity and revelation. That's why it's always such a blessing when I'm meditating, just like I said yesterday, thinking about this class and how I wanted to share Jeremiah 29, 11, and then boom, here comes Pastor Jenkins to teach it. So God speaks to his people. Even if you look on um, our Whosoever Believes um, page, we have a, a page where we just shared like a general timeline. And I noted even um, one of the people, Psalm 107 too, one of the people on there, she was sharing on uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. So God is not double-minded. When he's speaking, he speaks a word of clarity. He confirms it by two or more witnesses, the word of God said. Why? Because if we're all seeking the same God and all praying, he's going to speak to us in unison. And so Daniel had profound revelations. So the first beast, the lion, kingly, stately. When we think of a lion, we think of the king of the jungle, uh, majestic. Eagles also deemed to be kingly. That's why we adopt the eagles as our national symbol. Um, but as we said, his wings were plucked off. He stood as a man that represented King Nebuchadnezzar. Then we saw the second beast, a bear, which had a, has a voracious, uh, voracious appetite. He had three ribs. And then the word said, arise, devour, eat. Well, we believe that represents the Medo-Persian Empire. And the ribs were the three nations, Babylon, Egypt, and Lydia, many things that, that uh, were devoured by that empire. Then the third beast, the leopard. Leopard is quick, deadly, unpredictable. So was Alexander the Great, apparently, as he conquered the entire world. And that re represents the Greek Empire. And then the fourth beast, the ten horns, we said, represented Rome. And this is where we made the connection. Another little horn popped up. When we look at Daniel chapter 7 and verse 23, the 25, that's where he describes the little horn. And mind you, again, I don't want to miss this. In Daniel, before I look at those two verses, in chapter 7, verse 15, I, Daniel, was grieving my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. So it's not unusual for somebody to respond to these things with feeling grieved or troubled in their spirit. So those who feel some, you know, sense of unsettledness when we read these things, nothing wrong with that, but that's different from fear. And then verse 16, I came near to one of those who stood by. And of course, we believe that would have been an angel and asked him the truth of all this. So what was I saying earlier? When Daniel didn't understand, what did he do? He asked for the interpretation. And so he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Again, in the verse 16. In verse 17, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. And then verse 18, thanks be to God, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So Daniel got the revelation that these were four beasts because he asked. And then the um, the minister, the, the, I'm sorry, the angel broke down who all the beasts were. And then when you skip over to verse 23, you know, um, it then breaks down that fourth beast. So he's, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms and shall be by the whole earth, trample it and break it into pieces. The 10 horns are 10 kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. That's the little horn. He shall speak pompous words against the most high, shall persecute the saints of the most high, and shall intend to change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and a half a time. Now, one of the things I wanted to make note is again, we see this description of what many believe is a more futuristic vision 
you know, um, those behind us, the Roman, the Middle Persian, all those empires, we, we know we can go back in history and see those rising and falling, but this one represents an even more futuristic event. And, oh, it talks about how he would have dominion over the saints for time, times, and half a time. I want to just put a pin there. That represents three and a half years, most believe. The, the, the what we call the tribulation period or the period where the saints will go through, you know, under torment, under uh, tyranny of the Antichrist before he, he uh, dethroned. Uh, most believe it'll be a total seven year stretch, but that'll be the halfway point. A lot of debate about the what people say will be the tribulation period. Some say it will last seven years. Some say three and a half years. Some say the saints will be raptured up after the first three and a half years. Some say we'll be raptured up before the three and a half. You know, there's, that's a whole nother teaching. Again, I encourage you to take some classes that delve deeply into this kind of thing. But I wanted to point out when you see that times, time, time, times, and half a time, time meaning one, times two, and half a time. So most people interpret that as one year, then two years, then half a year. What does that equal out to? 42 months. So that's three years and a half. Three years is 36 months, plus six is 42, okay? And we'll see that in Revelation. So, this then correlates with Revelations 13. If you look at verse one through six, then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns. And on his horns, 10 crowns, and on his heads, a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. So some point out that encompasses all of the different animals or creatures, if you will, that Daniel saw, all wrapped up into one because he devoured everybody else. But that's just a footnote again. I'm not um, trying to interpret it all because honestly, it's a very um, heavily symbolic book. And let me, while I'm saying that, the book of Revelation has different parts. If you look at the first part, it's written as epistles it's written as seven churches that existed real churches and letters that were sent so to speak or, or spoken by jesus to them so you have some things that they call forth telling meaning interpretation of things that are and then you have some portions of this which are foretelling meaning telling what is to come in the future and that's where this falls in and then you have those epistles. So Revelation isn't all prophecy, it is a mixture. But here it's talking about this, this beast. Verse two, now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth, the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So the, they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy is that pompousness. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And I talked about time, times and half a time. That's three and a half years, that's 42 months. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So again, those who don't know Christ will worship him. So, I wanted to make that correlation only to show the connection between the prophetic vision of Daniel and what we see in Revelation. There is so much in Revelation, as I said last week, I wouldn't even attempt to try to teach all of that. 
but there is a correlation that validifies or, or confirms because God always confirms his word that what Daniel said saw was so. It just makes me esteem Daniel all the more as a great man of God and as a man who had his ear to God's mouth. So the little horn, what happens? He's conquered, thanks be to God. Uh, we read that when the ancient of days is seated um, on his throne, he is conquered by the son of man and the saints will reign. And we saw in Daniel 7, verse 11 through 14, and then 26 to 27. And then I just read um, part of Revelations 13. And it shows how, you know, he warred against the saints. So all this is to say that these same beasts or creatures that we see in Daniel that then are overcome by this little horn, we see that connection here in chapter 13 and other chapters in um, the book of Revelation. Now, when we wanted to get the interpretation, remember I read verses 15 and 16 in uh, Daniel because he was disturbed in his spirit and he asked for the interpretation. So you can go back and see how he talks about the four beasts and what each one represented. So, all of that is to give us an overview to see that when it's all said and done, we as the saints of God are victorious over the um, hand of the enemy. But there is a season where we have to war. And, and you read Revelations 12, how the devil was cast out and he came to earth to make war against the offspring of God. All those things are only to say, what we see in these days and times are symbolic of some of the things that we see in the book of Revelation. Where is it? Where are we in that time times timeline of Revelation? I would not even speculate to try to tell you. Those who study in those areas have different views of, of that. Some have called presidents. I remember someone calling President Reagan the Antichrist. People have called President Obama the Antichrist. People call Donald Trump the Antichrist. So that's why I say we know in part, but we don't know the whole thing yet. It's still unfolding. And, and even the word of God says, no one knows the day nor the hour of Christ's return. And for me, that's a big hint that even the most learned of men who study this stuff still don't know the real answer because God hasn't revealed it even to the angels, Jesus said. So for me, that's a hint that there's only so much he's going to let you know at this season um, because he determines the day and the hour of that return. Bottom line is, for me, again, is we win. We're triumphant. And at the end of it all, we, the saints, reign with Christ forever and ever and ever. Um, that was my intent to try to put a, a neat bow on this thing so that we could all be on one accord in understanding the connection. To get a deeper uh, understanding, take the Book of Revelations class, you know, take the classes on um, end time prophecies and the Book of Daniel, and you can dig even deeper. I wanted to kind of give you an over, uh, overview of what Daniel saw and, and how it connects. Reverend Letty. Yes, ma'am. Someone wants the scriptures from the last slide. Okay, let me go back. Okay. So in Daniel chapter 11, I'm sorry, chapter 7, verses 11 through 14, as well as verses 26 and 27, uh, that's where it talks about the Ancient of Days sitting on his throne, and then how the saints will conquer, will reign over him, over the Antichrist. And then ultimately, we can look at uh, Revelations chapter 13. Uh, you can really read one through seven, but I resumed in on five and six, just to show that parallel for that little horn being the pompous, you know, blasphemous entity that he is in both 
um, books. And then I put the interpretation so you could go and see how did we derive all this? How did we figure out it, those um, animals or those beasts represented nations? Because when Daniel asked, the angel told him, and that's in Daniel chapter seven, verses 15 to 18. Okay. Are there any other questions? Um, one of the things, again, you know, biblical interpretation, prophetic interpretation, that's another area of study. You know, things like when you see coming out of the sea or coming out of a great body of water, water often represents mankind. So when you see him coming out of the water, that's, just, you know, that lets us know it's a man. He's going to rise up from mankind. Um, they talk about the uh, 10 powerhouses or nations being represented again of the resurgent Rome and there's a lot of little nuances you would have to dig a little deeper to see them that are references that make them think it's Rome research resurfacing uh, Reverend Letty mm -hmm. Beatrice wants to know how can she get the previous studies because she just joined so if you go to our website whosoever believes dot o-r-g that's all one word whosoever believes dot o-r-g and look under our video tab you'll see all of the videos of all our different classes that we've had both this season and last really all of them um, it'll also link you to our youtube if you look under youtube under my name you'll see um, that as well uh, we encourage you to check out whosoever believes so our preference is, you know, to go there and make the links there. That does a lot of things for us in terms of being able to track. Um, we also ask, and this is a, a shameless plug, but we ask you when you go to YouTube to always hit like on the video because I've shared this before, but just again, I learned that when you hit like, it's not just, oh, look how many people like her video, because that's what I thought initially. That's why I never asked anybody to like my video. But what I learned is it causes that video to pop up. Why is that good? Just last week, a young man, 36 years old, to tell you how old I am, we say 36 is young, right? But anyway, <laughs> a young man emailed me because in, in my videos for the prayer line, I always say the Lord um, pray that the Lord draws people and I give an invitation. Well, he heard the video because he was on YouTube. Somebody asked him to look at a, a video of a, a song that they had played at their mom's home going service. And he said, as his video ended, mine popped up. And he said, normally I don't even listen to that stuff. You know, I just turn it off. Same on TV. You know, I don't even listen to that. He said, but your voice got me. I said, look at God, he'll use anything. But what is more important than any of that is he prayed the prayer of salvation and now he's saved. Why did that pop up? Because somebody hit like on that video. So now I have a totally different perspective. It's not even about popularity, it's about winning souls. So I just encourage you, if you do go on and look at our past videos, hit that like button. We don't know who sold they come to Christ because of that. I've had many over the last year either rededicate or give their heart to Christ because somebody somehow posted that or got them connected or they were on YouTube. Some of them were looking at other stuff and boom, it popped up and look at what God did to save souls. So I'm grateful to God for that. Amen. I saw somebody's hand. Is there another question? Where does the mark of the beast tie in? So if you go back to the book of Revelations, when it gives description to the, um, the beast in the book of um, Revelations, you can look in chapter 13 um, and just keep reading and you'll come to that place where it talks about him having the mark that he puts on people um, and even his number being 666, uh, Revelations 13, 17, and that no one may buy or sell 
buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So there'll come a point where whatever that thing is, the mark of the beast, some say it'll be an implant. Some say it's a credit card. Because think about it, you can't hardly buy anything with cash these days. They want you to have a credit card for everything. So, I'm, you know, so there's all kinds of theories what that mark will be. Some say it's going to be on your forehead, and there's a reference that suggests that it could be. Um, but the bottom line is there's some mark that the enemy will want you to take. You know, people have even theorized about the vaccine. Oh, they putting some in your arm. When you get the vaccine, they're going to have an implant and all this kind of craziness. But there's no historical or scientific that... Uh, support for that theory so i've rejected it uh, but mm -hmm. bottom line is there'll be some mark that will be associated with the enemy during that tribulation period while we've been uh, or the people here are being tormented or uh, challenged and harassed if you don't take the mark you won't be able to buy sell or anything and so many say there will be an under market you know a, a black market and that is to be a, a holy ghost market where you will trade and barter for things so you don't have to take that mark many scriptures talk about how think about lot and his wife and kids um, those who are what we call pre-tribulation people meaning that they believe that the people who have named the name of christ won't go through this because god will snatch us up out of here before that period then there are those who don't believe that'll happen until the middle after the 42 months. And then there are those who don't believe it'll happen until the end. My prayer is I ain't here then. So, <laughs> but whatever the case, we don't know. Again, you want to get into this? Go take an eschatology class so you can go dig deeper. Uh, but we don't know at this moment exactly what that mark will be. But there will be something that will put upon be put upon each person so that they can barter so that they can be tracked you know and even there are a lot of companies now that implant people so that for high tech kind of um high security kind of jobs some of them do have implants to mark you so that you can't walk into a facility without that but, okay Torres has a question she's unmuted okay i'm sorry i didn't have a question i must have hit something wrong okay <laughs> okay all right. Okay. All right. Do we have any other questions? One of the things that I love about this book is the worship. Uh, if you read over in various places, it just talks about how, you know, the, the 24 elders will fall before the throne and talk, cry, worthy is the Lamb. You know, there's just some heavy worship in the book of Revelations that is majestic and indeed celestial. Um, but if you keep reading in chapter 14, then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion. Of course, whenever you see the lamb, that represents Christ. Mm -hmm. And with him, 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpers playing their harps. I point that out because many teach, oh, there's only going to be 144,000 people in heaven. But that's not true because we know that the, the scriptures uh, earlier talked about how there were so many people around the throne, they were without number. So it doesn't stand to reason that there's only 144,000. Uh, I believe that Jehovah's Witness teach that. I wouldn't want to serve a God where there's only a certain number of us able to get in. <laughs> I might as well just go ahead and hang out and party all my life. If I'm not getting in, 144,000, that's nothing. So there's a lot of things in here that refute some of the foolishness that people teach over the years because they misinterpret. But um, we don't know some answers. I don't know some answers. As many speculate. You remember a few years ago when the guy took out $100 million billboards because it was the end of the world, gonna be like April something 12th or whatever it was. And he had people frightened out of their skin. You know, I remember kind of laughing at, I hate to say it, but I was like, if the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour, how does he know? And of course we know that day came and went. He lost 
everything. He had stations all over the world that followed him. Uh, he had spent millions of donated dollars on all these billboards. He had people petrified. And the day came and went. And then the next day, he just said, well, I guess I was wrong. Well, he just kind of disappeared into oblivion. And this guy was like a well-known teacher. I remember my mother-in-law would listen to him for years and years. Um, but anyway, people do because they don't read their scripture. The Bible says no one knows, not even the angels in heaven know, is what Jesus said when they asked him when would it be his return. So to me, you can learn a lot and get a sense of around the time, perhaps, if you are that deep, perhaps, I don't know, but you don't know. We only know in part. Read that in 1 Corinthians 13. So therefore, anything that anyone tells you where they say they exactly know something, I'm very skeptical because the scripture tells me nobody knows. Okay. Are all of the mass shootings related to the end times? Well, we know it's a sign of him getting nearer. Why? Because in, in Matthew, Jesus said, you'll see wars and rumors of war, nations rising against nations. Uh, there certainly is, as he said, uh, you'll know your time draws nearer. So we're closer today than we were yesterday. Are we in the last? last days people have been saying that for a long time you know we're in the last and evil days we're definitely in some evil days are they the last last days i don't know but they're definitely moving us toward what we know will be the end of time as we know it when heaven and earth the scripture says uh will pass away but there'll be a new heaven and a new earth but do we know exactly when no is this closer than we were yesterday certainly are there things that we see that mimic what we see in scripture definitely but we don't know exactly where we are you know some have even tried to speculate because there's seven seals that are in revelation that have to be opened before the end and some say oh we're in the fifth seal we're in the sixth seal we're in the seventh seal again for me i'm always very speculative when um uh, I find that to be very speculative, brother. I'm always suspicious when people start saying that because certainly there are things that we see that let me know we're nearing, but I don't know exactly where we are. Someone commented um, that the guy who brought all of the postings of the last days and times, he passed away. So it was his time. Mm -hmm. The guy who brought the billboards that was saying that oh, this was right. going to be the he end of time. Pass away. You're right. It was his time. I'm not sure why he passed away. If he didn't just pass away out of depression, but he passed away. You're right. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up. And we're going to wrap up Daniel with 815. We're going to bid Daniel goodbye. He's been a blessing to us. He challenged us with excellent character. He challenged us with um, keeping his heart toward the things of God and being very diligent and consistent in his worship and in his prayer time. If we would learn of him, then I believe we would also experience some of the profound things that he experienced. Of course, that we won't be another Daniel, but we'll be ourselves. But yet God can give us revelation as well. Amen. All right, so we have um, shared the word and we always know that God's word says, if he be lifted up, he will draw all men unto him. We want to give you an opportunity if you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior to receive him today. I know that God is pricking hearts. You know, people, he's using this time to get our attention if nothing else. Now, how far we are in this revelation timeline, I don't know. But I know, as I said, we're closer today than we were yesterday. And if you don't have the covering of the blood of Jesus, should he come back, you will be left behind. If you don't have his covering, that means you are going to die and have to pay the penalty for your sins. And the wages of sin is death. 
That means you will go to hell if you don't accept Christ because Christ died for your sins. He was sinless. So when he died, the scripture said he was the lamb of God who took on the sins of the whole world. That means that every sin we've ever committed, thank you, Jesus. Every sin that we ever will commit, Jesus already paid the price for. So when we accept Christ, I like it, liken it to being thrown overboard on an ocean liner. If somebody throws your life preserver, if you take it, you're going to be saved. If you don't, you're going to drown. The question is, which way are you going to go? It's your option. Nobody going to make you take them, but we can offer you to them offer him to you and we certainly pray that you won't let this opportunity pass if you know in your heart that you don't have the blessed assurance that jesus is your savior then you want to get that right how do you know because there's an assurance in your soul there's an assurance on the inside of you that the holy spirit lives in you and he gives you a peace to let you know you're his because he is the deposit, the scripture says. Like you pay on a down payment on a house. He's a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. The Holy Spirit comes to live in you when you accept Christ. And he gives you peace. If you feel your heart pounding, like, wow, I don't know if I'm saved. I'm not sure. That's the Holy Spirit knocking on the door of your heart. That's the Lord saying, let me in. I don't want you to perish. If you don't have that blessed assurance that you know, that you know, that you know, if you die right now, heaven forbid, that you would go to heaven, then I want you to say yes to the Lord today. If you want to accept Jesus as your savior, I want you to put your name in that chat box and say, I want to be saved. If you don't, know for sure you you're just not certain i'm not sure if i'm saved or not put your name in that chat box say, i'm not sure i want to make sure i want to be saved if you are in a position where you backslidden what does that mean you accepted christ but then when you look at your life you realize you know what i'm not living the way god wants me to live and i need to rededicate my life i want a fresh start with the lord put that in the chat because we want you to be saved. It's God's will that you be saved. In fact, the scriptures say he commands us to repent, meaning turn from our ungodly ways and turn to him. <coughs> so I'm inviting you to let us know so that we can make sure that you're saved. It's not deep. It's not complicated. All it takes is you to humble your heart and accept him today. In fact, I feel led to pray a prayer. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, you never got assurance that you're Savior, you, you backslid, and you want to rededicate, pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died for every one of my sins. I believe you were buried and God has raised you from the dead. Come into my heart, Jesus. Take control of my life. I repent of my sins and I'm turning to you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Amen and amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer, put that down in the chat. Say, hey, I prayed that prayer because guess what? You're saved. Now you are a child of God. And we want to just follow up with you to make sure you make good steps so that you can grow in Christ. It's like a coal. You know, if you keep it with the fire, it stays hot. But if it pulls it away and get it all by itself, it'll get cold. And the enemy likes to do that to separate us from the body of Christ so we can get lost and confused and not walk in our purpose. So we praise God for you. And we are believing God 
that there are many who will come to know him as we continue to be faithful in doing what he's called us to do.